The next speaker is a professor at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. And he's not a neuroscientist, he's a geneticist. Uh, he researches in particular the roles of genes in errors of human development, particularly birth defects. Please welcome Professor Fauzan al Kuraya. <laughs> welcome to the Brain Forum. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I'd like to convince you by the end of this talk of the limitless potential of doing human genetics work in this part of the world um, as it relates to uh, demystifying the making and the workings of the human brain. So let's see if this is going to work. OK, great. So people interested in the human body um, have known for a very long time that it's too complex to understand in, in one shot. And so people try to address this problem of complexity by studying one organ at a time. And of course, the brain is no exception. And in that sense, um, scientists have been trying to um, deconstruct each organ at the anatomical level. And by anatomy, we're talking all the way from gross anatomy to the single cell imaging that we just heard about. And physiologically, all sort of physiological assays. And this is all great. But then we have to think of the era of DNA. So since the discovery of the structure of the DNA and the establishment of the modern human genetics principles and, uh, and techniques, it's been very interesting to take a, um, a different look at the complexity of the organism. So it turns out that this organism's complexity can be reduced to a network of interacting proteins. And these proteins are nothing but the making of a beautifully designed software that resides in our DNA. So if you play with the DNA, you can see what's going to happen at the organismal level. And that's going to be a very, very powerful uh, way of looking at this very complex problem. So that really ushered in the era of transgenic animal work, where you play with one gene at a time. You either increase its expression or eliminate it or knock it out and see what's going to happen at the organismal level. And this is very helpful. The problem is. Mice are not humans, and not every result you get in mouse is necessarily generalizable to the human. So ideally speaking, the best way really to understand how each of these genes is related to the function, say, of the brain, because we're talking about the brain here, is to knock it out in humans. Now, this is not really as crazy as, as it may sound, because recently we have learned that the human race is really rampant with de novo mutations. And it turns out that as a male, you actually introduce two additional de novo mutations to your sperms every single year of your life. And if you think of more than 3 billion males on this planet, there's really no limit to uh, the possibilities of knocking out genes by introducing mutations at random. So essentially, every single gene you can think of has been knocked out in the human race. Uh, and we're not talking from the history of humanity. We're talking right now in, 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 in this uh, time and age. So that sounds fantastic, right? You're, you're randomly introducing mutations all over the place in, in the human genome. And you're knocking out these genes uh, right and left. Just go and find those individuals who are knocked out for these mutations. Uh, for, for these genes and find out how, how that knockout relates to the brain phenotype. If you're interested in the brain or some other organ, if you're interested in other organs. The problem is you're going to be faced with a stark reality, particularly when you're dealing with the brain. Because when, you're knock, when you knock out an important gene for brain structure or function, you're going to be facing the problem of reduced fitness. And that means that you end up having a pedigree where a de novo mutation has been introduced. It knocked out an important gene for a brain function. You get an individual in that family with that particular phenotype, and that's the end of it. 
that individual will not reproduce, so you're not going to get offspring of that individual. And the parents are not going to have another affected individual because it's a de novo mutation. And that's a problem. N of 1 is always a problem in science. Now, I, and, you know, as you try to find out what the gene is, other than the uh, problem of N of 1, you're going to be facing uh, the problem of finding the mutation one single letter that went wrong, presumably, out of 3.2 billion letters. And of course, we know that technology has improved. We know this is less of a problem these days, but it, it, it remains a very challenging problem. And what I'm here to tell you is, you know, I'm trying to be the bearer of good news and give you um, a scenario where this is going to be easier. So luckily, for most of the genes in our body, half a loaf is actually enough. In other words, when a mutation is introduced that knocks out one allele, you're perfectly fine at the organismal level with a single um, functional copy of that gene. Now, this has huge implication. It means that all of a sudden, you'll be able to find lots of individuals who, are, who have been knocked out for that gene because they evade the problem of natural selection. You know, their uh, reproductive fitness is, is perfectly fine. And that also means that when a heterozygote mates with another heterozygote, you have a chance of seeing the, that observation of the, two, of the two copies of the gene knocked out in more than one child. Yes, each of these children may not be able to reproduce, that's the problem that I told you about, but within a family or within an extended family, you'll be able to find more than one affected individual. And that's extremely important because, as I told you, N of 1 is a problem. But once you have more than one, you can formulate a hypothesis and try to make your um, mapping gene mapping uh, much more doable. So as we know, most of marriages in Saudi Arabia are consanguineous. And here's what consanguinity does for you. Now, if you follow this ancestral haplotype that I painted in, in blue, and just um, follow its transmission from one generation to another, now we see this individual who inherited that haplotype, that ancestral haplotype, from each parent. So basically, that individual has the exact same haplotype twice. So that's a form of homozygosity that is best called autozygosity because you really talk about the exact same haplotype, right? And because you see this throughout the genome, I like to call this the autozygome. So the collection of these autozygous blocks per individual is what's called the autozygome. Now, what follows is something very interesting. If the ancestral haplotype happen to harbor a recessive mutation. As I said, this individual is going to evade the problem of natural selection, so he's going to be able to reproduce. But then this individual, who is now stuck with two copies of that recessive mutation, is going to have a phenotype. He's completely knocked out for a gene, and now he's going to have, let's say, a brain phenotype. But that's not the whole story. That mutation is inherited on a background of a haplotype that is actually tractable. So you'll be able to see um, a lot of individuals who are heterozygotes for that knockout. And you have more than one affected individual. And on top of that, you have a lamppost that tells you where to look for the mutation. So instead of you know, holding that lens in that figure that I showed you looking at the 3.2 billion base pairs, you only look for those homozygous blocks. That's the block that surrounds the mutation, right? And to top it all off, nowadays we have amazing sequencing technologies that allow you to go through thousands of genes. So if you're interested in a particular locus that you think, aha, this is where my um, mutation is, I can use the new techniques. So I don't have to sequence one gene at a time, but I can sequence all of them and find my mutation just like that. Um, and this is really, um, this has been a fantastic way of looking um, at the human genome um, in terms of finding genes that are relevant to the brain or any other organ. Now, I'm actually, my lab is interested, um, uh, among several things, in a condition known as primordial dwarfism. Those of you who've never seen a patient with primordial dwarfism may not be even able to imagine what it looks like. So you're all familiar with achondroplasia, you know, these uh, individuals who are very short, they're called dwarfs because of abnormal bone development. I'm sure all of you have seen a patient uh, or someone in the street with achondroplasia. And I just want you to 
Notice this. This is a two and a half year old child with achondroplasia, right? This is a patient with premortal dwarfism. Almost, she looks like his doll because she is so small. So you're talking about someone who's six years old and you can't carry him or her in your lap. They're very, very small. And their whole body is small, but their brain is also very small. So I'm fascinated by this disorder because it tells us about something very basic in, in human biology, which is growth. How do we grow? How do we get to be the size we are now? And so this is the first family that uh, um, I recruited. It's a family with this condition, premortal dwarfism. And because I showed you how you can get several affected individuals in these consanguineous pedigrees, it was a no-brainer to simply do the mapping that I told you about and come to the conclusion that there is one nice locus. And within that locus, there was an extremely interesting gene known as SEMPJ. Um, that gene is very interesting because several years before, it had been um, implicated in the pathogenesis of a condition known as primary microcephaly. So primary microcephaly is a condition where the brain is extremely small. There's a problem at the very initiation of brain development at the level of neuroprogenitors, such that the brain at the end is extremely small. And I thought it, was, it would be interesting because CMPJ, CNPJ, or the other name is CPAP, um, would be a good candidate even though it's never been um, linked to premotor dwarfism. And sure enough, we did identify mutation in the SMPJ. And so that was, that was really exciting because if you think about how SMPJ causes the brain to be very small, SMPJ is actually a very important centriolar controller. So it controls the duplication of the centrioles. And those of you uh, who are familiar with, with the centriole and its role in biology know that you need to divide the centriole in order for the cell to divide, right? And I thought, well, this is a fascinating way of converging primordial dwarfism with primary microcephaly, because now we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have the same mechanism where the cells throughout the body are unable to divide, and that's why during the embryonic development, during that critical period, you're not reaching your target, uh, your target size. And we were very pleased a couple of years later that uh, a group actually published the mouse for SEMPJ, and they were able pretty much to replicate everything we identified in our patients. And it was really interesting because PAC1A is a major centriolar protein. So here again, we're showing that in patient cells, instead of seeing this nice bipolar distribution of your mitotic spindle, you get tripolar or quadripolar where you have several poles in the mitotic, uh, uh, for the mitotic spindles to anchor on the chromosomes, and that completely confuses uh, the cell and activates the checkpoint to halt the division. And we showed that there's an overduplication phenotype of the centrioles. Um, and we were able to show this independently through knocking down the gene in, in, in control patient cells. Could there be another way that primary microcephaly and primordial dwarfism can converge? We were very fortunate to collaborate uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Samira Saqati from Jeddah on, on this family. This is a family with a classical form of primordial dwarfism uh, known as Seckel syndrome. They have the classic Seckel faces and they're very, very tiny with very small brain. And again, using the same method that I told you about, we were able to map it to a single locus shown here in black. And within that locus, we identified a mutation DNA2. So really, that locus that we identified is defined by a DNA2 mutation. Now, why is that interesting? It's very interesting because DNA2 has a very well-established role in DNA damage repair, such that if you lose DNA2 in, 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 um, in cells, you have impaired response um, to DNA damage. You're unable to repair the DNA damage, and that affects the, uh, uh, the proliferation potential of the cells. And that's indeed what we were able to show in the patient cells. Um, so we thought that would be a fantastic way of, again, converging the mechanism of these two entities, the premortal dwarfism and the primary microcephaly, because a lot of the primary microcephaly genes are also known to play a role in DNA damage repair. And in the course of doing this, we were able also to solve another family with uh, premotor dwarfism. We were able to solve it at the gene level, and we implicated XRCC4, 
Uh, this is just to show you how we can filter out the tons of data uh, taking advantage of the autozygote concept that I told you. You only focus on a particular region of the genome, you eliminate all the rest, and you end up with very few variants. In this case, I believe it's a single variant or a couple of variants. And we were very pleased because XRCC4 is a partner of uh, the ligase 4, and the two are very critical for DNA damage repair. So when you have mutations in the, in the ligase 4, you also have primordial dwarfism. So it made perfect sense to us. So really what I showed you was just a little flavor. It's really a tiny tip of a huge iceberg. We have tons and tons and tons of other examples of published and unpublished uh, genes that are knocked out and the brain phenotype ranges all the way from intellectual disability to loss of particular brain function or brain region. And just to put things in perspective and to really enthuse the younger generation of uh, Saudi scientists in, in, in this audience, just in our lab alone, we were able to, uh, over the span of a few years, to identify 54 out of the estimated 1,600 recessive genes or so that remain to be identified. So you can imagine the huge potential of doing this work. It's, it's, these are really low-hanging fruits that are just ready to be picked by, uh, by you know, scientists who believe in the power of, of this approach to demystifying the complexity of any organ, not just the brain, any organ. I'm not going to get into the details, but I just want you to get an idea of how different alleles can really inform us about two different things in the brain. And there's no limit to the alleles, right? You can, you can have as many alleles that you can imagine, even though we have a set number of 20 or 23,000 genes. Obviously, I'm not here to suggest naively that each allele is going to predict a particular phenotype. And I think this is a telling story. And this was a fantastic collaboration uh, with Dr. Saeed Buhleqa. It's, it's the first uh, mapping story that we published uh, uh, with my colleague and chairman, Dr. Uh, uh, Brian Meyer. This is a condition known as uh, woodhouse sakati syndrome. And these individuals have alopecia, hypogon hypogonadism, diabetes, and other problems, but they also have a very prominent neurological phenotype in the form of intellectual disability and dystonia. And I think what's really telling is that of the 20 plus families that we identified with this disorder, they all have the exact same pathogenic allele, the exact same mutation. And yet, look at the variability. I'm circling in red all those individuals who are completely normal neurologically. Within the same family, you have someone who's going to college, and another who's completely devastated neurologically. So clearly, it's, it goes beyond allelic determinism. There is more to the story. But I think the point is, why don't we invest more in stuff that we really understand? Mendelian genetics is something we really understand, we're very good at. You look at children with intellectual disability, and even today, most of them were unable to find the gene that caused their intellectual disability. Because we have, as I showed you, we have hundreds and hundreds of genes that remain to be identified, right? And again, what I'm trying to say is, why don't we really invest more in stuff that we know has a very large effect? I've shown you multiple examples of single letter change making huge difference in the outcome of the brain or the organism uh, as a whole. And I hope the message of, of this is really to interest the younger people to pursue careers in, in Mendelian genetics, at least in, 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 in Saudi Arabia, because I really believe this, is, this remains to be a very fertile land for huge discoveries can re, that can inform the world about you know, the, the mysteries of, of this magnificent uh, organ, the brain. Finally, um, I'd like to thank all the members of my lab uh, the administration of my institution, the core facilities that we're blessed to have at King Faisal uh, Specialist Hospital and Research Center, and uh, my funding uh, sources, and thank you for your attention.